An API gateway acts as a single point of entry into a microservices system. API gateways solve many problems like rate limiting, request routing, load balancing, and what we are going to talk about in today's video, authentication and authorization. The API gateway is typically the first component inside of a microservices system that an incoming request touches. So it makes a lot of sense to use it to enforce security and implement authentication and authorization on the API gateway level. Let's say we have a client application sending requests to our system, where our system is everything inside of the white box here. The first component that the incoming request touches is the API gateway. In this case, it's implemented using the YARP reverse proxy, and you can see that YARP also interacts with an identity provider. The specific identity provider used here is Keycloak. So this is where the API gateway fits inside of our system, but let's see if we can be more specific. We can use API gateways to enforce centralized access to our downstream services, and this allows us to abstract a lot of implementation details, like load balancing if we are using service discovery, rate limiting, and so on. From the perspective of the outside world, which is the client application, it's not aware that our system contains downstream services, which are these components here. It only knows that it's sending a request to one service, which is the API gateway. And then the API gateway can decide to route the request to the respective component downstream. And because the API gateway gives us this centralized control into our system, it makes a lot of sense to use it to enforce authentication and authorization. So we are going to use our API gateway to verify the identity of the user who is trying to make the request and then determine if this request is allowed to proceed to the downstream service. From an implementation perspective, the authentication mechanism could be anything. It could be a cookie or a JSON web token. We could be using API key authentication. It doesn't really matter. What is important is that we add a layer of protection at the API gateway level before we reach our downstream services. So let's jump into the code and look at a practical example of implementing API gateway authentication inside of ASP.NET Core. This is the system that we're going to use for the example, and it contains two web APIs. One of them is going to be our API, and the other one is going to act as our API gateway. The API gateway has a very minimal setup. It's just configuring the YARP reverse proxy from the application settings, and it's mapping the reverse proxy, and this is everything there is to it. Currently, we aren't enforcing any authentication rules, and we can freely send requests to our backend. If I open up the application settings, you can see that I have the reverse proxy configuration here with the routes and the clusters. The clusters represent the actual URIs of the downstream services, and you can see I only have one downstream address, which is my API instance running on the port 8080. For this downstream cluster, I only have one route configured, with a default authorization policy and a catch-all pattern that's going to route any incoming request to the one downstream service that we have. What's interesting here is the default authorization policy that we are going to discuss a bit later, but let's also check out our API, which only contains one minimal API endpoint, so we pretty much have a hello world example. So now let's go back to our reverse proxy or the API gateway and see how we can introduce authentication. And the simplest way to approach this is to use the ASP.NET Core authentication abstractions. So I'm going to say builder services, and then I will say add authentication, and this will introduce the required services to perform authentication on the API gateway. I also need to specify what is the default authentication scheme, and let's say I want to use bearer token authentication, so I'm going to access the bearer token defaults static class, and I can specify the authentication scheme constant. I'm also going to introduce token authentication by calling add bearer token, and this is going to allow me to obtain a bearer token when signing in from an API request. The next component we need is the authentication and authorization middleware. So after calling builder build and obtaining my application instance, I'm going to call use authentication to introduce the authentication middleware. And then I will say use authorization to introduce the authorization middleware. After that, we're going to map our reverse proxy endpoints like we did before. And the only thing remaining is to map some minimal API endpoints. So let me introduce an endpoint on the API gateway that's going to allow me to authenticate with my API. I will call this the login endpoint, if I could type. And all I'm going to do here is return a sign-in result by saying results and then sign-in. And this allows me to specify a claims principle. So let's go ahead and create a new claims principle instance. And what a claims principle needs 
is a claims identity. And this is what actually contains the claims that we can use to implement authorization later on. So let's create a new claims identity. And you can see that I can now specify my claims. And let's create an array of claims and create a new claim. And let's call this the subclaim, which is the subject claim. And let's just make this into a random good. So I'll say good, new good, and convert this into a string. So our claims identity is only going to contain one claim for the time being. I'm also going to specify another argument to this constructor, which is going to be my authentication type. I will use bearer token defaults and specify the authentication scheme. And let's also specify the authentication scheme as another argument to the sign in method. I have to specify the argument name and then I will say bearer token defaults and specify authentication scheme. And this is one of the simplest ways that you can obtain a bearer token in ASP.NET Core. So let me start the API and show you how this is working. I'm going to use the HTTP file in my gateway project to define a GET request that I'm going to send to my API gateway. And this is what a request to the login endpoint would look like. So if I hit send, you will see that my login endpoint is going to give me back a response which contains an access token and a refresh token. And then we can use this access token to authenticate with our API gateway. What's important to note here is that this is just a bearer token. It's not an actual JSON web token, which is what you would want to use if you also want to apply this in a distributed system. But for our example, a bearer token should be sufficient. Now, let me send a request to my downstream service through the API gateway without an access token present. And you can see that we get a 401 unauthorized response. However, if I specify a valid access token here and then send this request again, you can see that we get a 200 OK response as well as the string that is returned from our downstream endpoint. So let me stop the API. And if you are wondering how we introduced authentication, it is because we specified an authorization policy in our reverse proxy settings. The default policy is one of the pre-configured policies with Yarp. The other one is anonymous, which allows us to expose API endpoints to unauthenticated users. So I can specify anonymous, for example, for a register endpoint where somebody wants to sign up to my application. This is very similar to specifying the allow anonymous attribute on a controller endpoint or a minimal API endpoint. And then the default policy here is very similar to the authorized attribute that we have with controllers. So here's a question for you. Did you notice the huge advantage that Yarp has when it comes to authentication in ASP.NET Core? If you didn't, let me explain it again. YARP is able to integrate with the built-in authentication and authorization mechanisms, which also means that we can introduce custom authorization policies and use them with YARP. So how we would do this is by saying builder services. Then I'm going to say add authorization. And this allows me to provide a delegate for the authorization options where I can, for example, introduce a custom authorization policy. Because I plan to introduce multiple policies, I will call this policy first API access, and this is going to be our policy name, and then I can configure the actual policy. For example, I can say policy require authenticated user, and this is going to be similar to the default policy that we have with Yarp, but I can also chain additional requirements here. For example, I can check that a specific claim is present. So let's say I'm looking for a claim called first API access, which is also the same as my policy name because I'm not that creative. And this is going to be a Boolean claim that I'm going to introduce through the login endpoint. So it can have either a true or false value. And let's say to satisfy this policy, you need to have a first API access claim that has a value of true. So this is how I can specify an authorization policy. Let me add another authorization policy right away and I will call this the second API access, and I'm going to require for the second API access claim to be present. Now, let's go ahead and introduce these claims inside of our login endpoint. So I'm going to copy this twice, and then let's assign the names to our claim. And then let's update the name of our claim. So this is first API access. And then let me also add the second API access. Now, when it comes to the values of these claims, I'm just going to allow them to be exposed through query parameters. So let's say I have a first API query parameter and a second API query parameter, and all of these have a default value of false. Then I'm going to say first API to string, 
as the value of the first claim and I will say second API to string as the value of the second claim. So by default, when you log in, you won't have access to any of our two APIs. So let's see if this is the case, but I also need to update my proxy settings and actually use my custom authorization policy. So all I have to do is specify first API access, which is the name of the custom policy that I configured with ASP.NET Core and Yarp is able to pick this up find the required policy and then check if the current user satisfies that authorization policy. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to send another request to the login endpoint to obtain an access token. And remember that I didn't specify any of the query parameters, so they will have default values, which means that my two claims will not have the value that's required by my authorization policy. So if I send this request again, you can see I'm getting a 403 forbidden response. So now I'm going to grab another access token and I will say first API true, and this should give me the required claim. So let's see if I take this access token now and specify it here and then send another request to my downstream service. And this time you can see I'm getting a 200 OK request. So our custom authorization policy is working. Now let's say I want to introduce another downstream API. I'm going to do this by running another instance of the one API that I have with a different name. So let's call this API2. I need to give it a different container name and I'm going to expose it on the port 6000 and 6001. But it's running the same Docker file as the original API instance. Now I'm going to update my proxy settings to introduce another API cluster. So let's call this the API2 cluster. And then the downstream route is going to be API2 because this is the name of my service with Docker Compose. I'm also going to add another API route, which is going to be the API2 route. And it's going to be using the API2 cluster for the downstream services. And this one will require second API access. Now I'm also going to update my paths so you're going to reach the first API by specifying first dash API here. And then you will reach the second API by specifying second API here. I will also need to add a transformation to my downstream request, which is going to transform anything that's coming after first API or second API in the route to the format of the endpoint that's exposed on my two downstream services. So now if I start my services again and I send a request to authenticate with my API, and this time I'm configuring both claims to be present. And what I expect to happen is to be able to reach both of the downstream services. If I open up Docker Compose, you can see that I have two instances of the API service running. And my API gateway is routing requests between these services. So if I send a request to the first API slash hello route, this is going to be routed to my first API instance. And you can see that I'm getting a 200 OK response. Now let's define another API endpoint for the second API and send this request. And you can also see I'm getting a 200 OK response. So my custom authorization policies are working as expected. And if I go into my API gateway logs, you can see how it's proxying the request to the respective service. This is the log from the API gateway, which is proxying to the first API instance, which has a route of HTTP API. The API endpoint that we are calling is API slash hello. And then in the second example here, you can see that we are calling the HTTP API2 service and routing the request to the same API endpoint. So what we demonstrated with this example is how easy it is to introduce authentication into the ARP reverse proxy by just setting up authentication with ASP.NET Core and introducing the required middleware. And I also showed you some interesting things that you can do with YARP, such as configuring your custom authorization policies and then applying them on your API routes by specifying the authorization policy value. And if you want to learn how to implement load balancing for your microservices, then you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses. And until next time, stay awesome.